All right, folks, you're all welcome to a meeting of the Justice uh, Committee. Do the needful with any electronic devices. Any declaration of interests related to today's business, now is the time to declare them. If not, we will proceed. Okay, thank you. Um, the oral evidence sessions and the formal clause-by-clause -clause consideration of the Committal Reform Bill will be reported by Hansard, if members are agreed. Agreed. Apologies from Doug Beattie, Gordon Dunn, Emma Rogan and um, Paul Frew. Um, we have Linda Dillon and Rachel Wood, Sinead Bradley and Gemma Dolan joining us via the Starley facility. Um, Paul may join the meeting later, but he's not here just at the moment. Any uh, allocation of votes? Sure, we can't hear you. Oh, OK. Can now. OK. Could everybody else hear whenever I was talking? No, nobody? OK. Sorry for that. Uh, let me go back to the start. Um, any declarations of financial interests related to today's business, now is the time to declare it. No? Okay, thank you. With apologies from Doug, Gordon, Emma and Paul Frew and Linda, uh, Rachel and Sinead and Gemma are all via the Starley facilities. Any declaration of votes? Um, yes. Understanding Order 1156, Gordon Dunn has delegated his vote to the Chairman, Paul Given, and Emma Rogan has delegated her vote to the Deputy Chairperson, Linda Dillon. Okay, thank you. The draft minutes of the meeting of the 29th of April, if members are content that they are true reflection, then we can agree them and I will then sign them. All agreed? Agreed. A couple of matters arising. Committee Forward Work Programme. Um, it's now been updated to reflect the changes that were agreed at our meeting last week and that's just in your meeting pack. The oral evidence sessions on the stocking bill with representatives from Women Aids, Human Rights Commission and other organisations to be confirmed will take place at the meeting next week. So, members, the forward work programme is there for noting. Uh, item four, then, is the uh, domestic abuse protection notice orders. There's officials attending via the Starleaf uh, facility. So, if we can bring those officials into the spotlight, please. Um, hopefully, the relevant papers are in your meeting pack, members. And um, we should be joined now by Dr. Veronica Holland, Emma Crozier, and Alison Fitzgerald, um, all from the Violence Against the Person branch within DOJ, and Jane McGuire, the Family Courts and Tribunal branch, Civil Policy Division within the Department of Justice. And uh, just to advise, the session will be recorded by Hansard and a transcript published on the committee webpage in due course. So, can I? Hand over to Dr. Holland at this stage to outline the results of the consultation on the proposals for the domestic abuse protection notices and orders and the proposed next steps. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you, Chair Holland. Can you hear us okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Good. I'm going to hand over to Emma, who works with me, who's going to give an overview of the consultation responses, and then we're obviously happy to answer any queries from members after that. Hello, good afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity to brief you on the outcome of the consultation on enhancing legal protections for victims of domestic abuse. Um, as members will know, at its meeting on the 3rd of December, the committee agreed to a public consultation on proposals to introduce domestic abuse protection notices and orders. The consultation was subsequently lodged on the 7th of December and closed on the 19th of February. Um, if members are content, I will provide a brief summary of the responses received to the various questions and then I'll outline our proposed next steps. Um, the Department received a total of 38 written responses from a range of organisations. A number of individuals also corresponded um, with the Department to share their, their personal accounts. Um, as members will be aware, domestic abuse protection notices would provide immediate protection following a domestic abuse incident, while domestic abuse protection orders from the court would provide flexible longer term protection for victims. Uh, the majority of responses were supportive of the overall proposal to introduce these notices and orders. <clears throat> the consultation Sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> the consultation document had noted that there would be provision made in the forthcoming Justice Bill during the amendment stage to provide for enabling powers through secondary legislation. As Section 27 of the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Act now provides that the Department may, by regulations, make provision to bring forward steps or measures to protect victims of domestic abuse, including through new notices and orders, though not necessarily limited to this, 
the Department would intend to make use of these powers to progress the new protection measures. Um, in terms of the length of time that a domestic abuse protection notice should be valid for before the police have to apply to the Magistrates Court for a domestic abuse protection order, we received um, a wide range of views. After considering these, we are of the view that a period of up to four days would be most appropriate. Reflecting on the comments raised during the consultation, including from a PSNI operational perspective, and some of the concerns expressed about human rights implications, as well as the associated risk of challenge that this would give rise to, we consider that this time frame balances the need to provide PSNI with, with enough time to apply for an order against the need to consider the impact on the person subject to the notice. Um, having further liaised with the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, um, we will undertake a human rights impact assessment on this aspect and will consider the findings before drafting the regulations. The time period agreed will be kept under review following introduction of the notices and orders and can be revised if considered necessary. The majority of respondents agreed that there should be multiple routes via which an application for an order can be made. Respondents agreed that many victims of domestic abuse may not want or feel able to make an application themselves or may not want to make contact with police. It was agreed um, that the police, victims themselves, the courts and specified third parties, potentially with the leave of the court, should all be able to apply for an order. Regulations will provide that before making an order, the court will consider the opinion of the person to be protected by it, where the court is aware of this, although an order could be made without the consent of the person to be protected. It was generally agreed that regulations should specify the relevant third parties who potentially would be able to apply for an order with varying views as to the scope of this. Given the wide range of suggestions made by respondents in relation to the third parties and concerns raised by the Bar and the Law Society, we wish to consider this matter further. And discussions will also be held with colleagues in other jurisdictions on this matter. Uh, the majority of respondents agreed that courts should be able to make orders of their own volition during other proceedings, including in criminal trials. Given the, over given the overwhelming support from respondents, the draft regulations will make provision for this. <clears throat> um, following the introduction of domestic abuse protection orders across Northern Ireland more generally and in the longer term, we asked whether courts should be able to impose positive requirements as well as prohibitions as part of the conditions attached to the proposed order. Sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> of the respondents who answered this question, almost 90% agreed that this should be the case. We note the general support for positive requirements and agree in principle to adding them to orders in the longer term, subject to further consideration and the necessary funding being available. It is not the intention of the department to introduce positive requirements during the pilot or initial introduction of the orders. The majority of respondents agreed that courts should be able to require individuals subject to an order to notify personal details to the police. We therefore intend to proceed on this basis. A wide range of views were given in terms of what personal details should be required to be provided. We consider that the information to be held needs to be proportionate, relevant and appropriate from a domestic abuse perspective and wider public risk. We are therefore proposing that regulations will, will require a person subject to the order to notify the police of their name and where they use one or more other names, each of these names and their home address. The need for any additional notification requirements will be considered further, taking into account the consultation responses ahead of drafting the regulations. The regulations will provide that it will be an, an offence not to give these details to the police to deal with issues around non-compliance. As, well, <coughs> as well as enabling conditions to protect the victim, we asked if it should be open to the courts to impose conditions within the order requiring the alleged perpetrator not to approach or contact any associated children. Of the respondents who answered this question, 83% agreed that this should be the case. 
Given support in relation to this proposal, the Department intends to proceed on this basis. Further detail will be set out in regulations and we will give consideration to issues raised by consultation respondents as part of this. The regulations will also consider how best to secure compliance with conditions imposed. We asked whether provision should be made that would, in the longer term, enable courts to be given an express power to impose electronic monitoring as a condition of a domestic abuse protection order. Of those respondents answering this question, 71% agreed that this should be the case. It was considered that this would give additional safety and assurances, allow victims to remain in their own homes safely and without fear, and that this and that this had been proven to be an effective management tool in other areas of offending. PSNI noted that it would be essential that any measures were proportionate, appropriate, lawful and necessary. The bar did not support the proposal, raised concerns about electronic monitoring in the absence of a criminal offence and considered that further work is needed on this, including how the department will successfully increase compliance. They also stated that an assessment of compliance with ECHR rights would be needed. Given the mixed views and concerns raised, including around human rights, further consideration will be given to this matter ahead of any introduction in the longer term, as suggested by respondents. We would also conduct a human rights impact assessment on this matter and engage further with key stakeholders, including the Human Rights Commission, before reaching a decision on whether provision should be made. Um, in the longer term that would enable courts to um, impose electronic monitoring as a condition of an order. Um, turning now to breach of orders, there was general agreement that a breach should be a criminal offence. It was considered that it would also encourage um, individuals to comply with orders and act as a deterrent. Noting the strong support, we intend to proceed on this basis. Of those um, of those that agreed that breach of the proposed order should be a criminal offence, 37% agreed that an alternative punishment should be contempt of court. These respondents agreed that this should be an option if the victim requests it and if the court considers it to be in the victim's and, where appropriate, any children's interests. However, there was concern for the ability to freely consent where they are being coerced. PPS noted that this alternative is rarely exercised in Northern Ireland, if at all, and offered to conduct further inquiries into the use of contempt proceedings locally. 23% of respondents did not agree with the proposal, while the remaining respondents didn't answer either way. Recognising the mixed views received in relation to this question, we will consider this matter um, further, including asking PPS to conduct inquiries into the use of contempt proceedings in Northern Ireland. We also asked if courts should have flexibility in determining how long to impose an order for, depending on the particular circumstances of the case. Out of the respondents who answered this question, 90% agreed with this proposal and we intend to draft regulations to reflect this. On the issue of whether courts should be able to vary or discharge orders, either of their own volition or at the request of the victim, alleged perpetrator or the applicant, 63% of those that responded agreed. Nine respondents made up of members of the public and organisations supporting victims were of the view that courts should not be able to vary or discharge orders. On balance, we consider that courts should have the ability to do this in line with existing protective orders. We propose that applications to vary or discharge an order can be made by the person for whose protection the order was made the person against whom the order was made, the person who applied for the order, or the police if they didn't apply for it. In addition, we propose that before deciding whether to vary or discharge an order, the court must hear from the police if they wish to be heard, and the person for whose protection the order was made, if they are the person seeking to get the order discharged or make it less onerous. This would enable an assessment to be made of whether any victim was being coerced or intimidated. The court would have to be satisfied that any variation in the order is necessary to protect the person from domestic abuse or the risk of domestic abuse, and that any discharge was on the basis that the order as imposed is no longer necessary to protect the person from domestic abuse or the risk of domestic abuse. 
In addition, the court will also be required to consider the welfare of any associated children and the opinion of any relevant occupant of the premises lived in by the person for whose protection the order was made. The consultation noted that the intention was to pilot notices and orders in two geographical loca locations. A number of respondents considered that this was a re reasonable approach. Others were not in favour, while some stated that it would need to be time limited. We remain of the view that the notices and orders should be piloted in two areas, urban and rural, to ensure lessons can be learned to shape the model for implementation. We have noted concerns about the length of the pilot period, but consider that this needs to be long enough to give an indication of costs and to properly test the model. We therefore consider that the pilot period is likely to be for 12 to 18 months. Other preventative and protective orders will, of course, continue to be available for victims in non-pilot areas during this time. In terms of locations, we had suggested possibly Belfast and one more rural area. Views on possible pilot areas were mixed. In light of this, we are going to engage with PSNI and courts to further consider the most suitable areas. With regards to the pilot in the urban area, the two areas for consideration are now likely to be Belfast and Derry, Londonderry, given the views raised by respondents. So to conclude, um, the department has agreed to undertake a number of actions prior to beginning work on the drafting of regulations and guidance. Um, we will further consider which individuals or organisations should be specified as relevant third parties, potentially with the leave of the court. Consider the need for additional notification requirements specific to domestic abuse. Conduct a human rights impact assessment, including in the context of the time period for making an order and any future electronic monitoring. Also taking into consideration issues raised by respondents ahead of drafting regulations. Um, we will also engage with PPS to determine the use of contempt proceedings in Northern Ireland and we will engage with the Judicial Studies Board on raising awareness of notices and orders amongst the judiciary. Um, we also plan to further consider what steps, if any, can be taken within the court process to prevent an order being discharged as the result of a victim being pressurised by the person subject to the order. Um, we will liaise with justice partners on the location of the two pilots, one urban, one rural, and will consider establishing a multi-agency task and finish group and oversight group to plan for the introduction of pilots. pilots. And finally, we will review legal aid or arrangements with regards to the orders. And in the longer term, we will also identify positive uh, potential positive requirements to be associated with orders subject to further consideration and the necessary funding being available and we will engage with stakeholders on relevant issues including human rights such as the Human Rights Commission as well as undertake further work before reaching a decision on whether provisions should be made in the longer term to enable courts to be given an express power to impose electronic monitoring as a condition of an order. Um, I hope this overview um, was helpful to the committee and we are now um, happy to take any questions or queries that you may have. Thank you. Right. Thank you. And you persevered very well with the, the croaky voice so you can have a glass of water there. Um, just a couple of quick questions for me and then I'll bring in the committee members. You, you touched on the, the regulations then um, in terms of when they're going to be brought to the Assembly. I'm keen to find out just what time scale you're operating to. In terms of the legislative time frame, Chair, um, you know, obviously there's a, a range of further kind of exploratory work to be undertaken in terms of the, the policy detail, um, including with key stakeholders that we'll need to progress before we begin the process of drafting the regulations. We're obviously keen to, to have um, these measures in place as soon as we can, and I think certainly in terms of the legislative provision within the Domestic Abuse Act. Um, the indications for that are that the regulations would be in place, I think, within two years of the new domestic abuse offence um, coming into place. But we'll obviously want to try and, and move that work forward as, as quickly as we can. OK, thank you. Um, if I can bring in then Linda Dillon, uh, then it'll be Sinead Bradley and Rachel Woods in that order. But Linda Dillon, first of all. 
Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of quick questions. The first one is in relation to the four days and how that was really settled upon, because obviously in the consultation responses there were suggestions around seven days and even up to ten days. Now, I think ten days in fairness might be um, a wee bit much, but the, the seven days may well be. I think the, the, the compromise there, but if there's a if there's a reasoning behind specifically the four days, now I know PSNA had actually suggested that four days was adequate and, and that may well be where that's come from, but it's just would like to explore that further. Um, I mean, just in relation to the longer term positive requirements, such as uh, requiring an individual to attend the behavioural change programme, and I'm wondering when, you know, what precise work will now be carried out in the short term and is it possible to give a time frame for when those requirements might be introduced? The electronic um, monitoring as a condition, I mean, you've outlined some of the issues that, that may come up and, and I know you're doing further work into that, so I, I don't think there's any need to go into that at this stage other than just to, to flag up that obviously there would be a concern, but uh, that is why you're doing the further work on it, to be fair. The pilot schemes then, um, I'm glad to hear that there's going to be one in a rural area as a representative for a large rural constituency and that it's not just um, urban focused because obviously rural areas have, have different challenges. Just in relation to the pilot schemes, and you did touch on it there, so um, apologies if I'm putting you back over stuff, but just to go back to that, Will there be work done while those pilot schemes are being carried out? Will the work be done to ensure that it can be rolled out very quickly? Because I've said this before, we're as a committee, we're, and, and this goes for right across, to be honest, the different committees, yeah. we're pilot schemed out and pilot schemes are run and then everybody says it was wonderful and it worked brilliantly, but we're not in a position yet to actually roll it out because of budgetary constraints and all of that. So what what I would like to say is whilst the pilot scheme is ongoing, that business case and budgets and everything else are put in place for the full rollout rather than waiting to see how the pilot schemes go. We know these are going to be introduced and it's just a matter of, of perhaps maybe some minor tweaks. So Chair, those are my comments for now. And just I suppose just in terms of you, you said that you were looking at what it yeah the issues may be around legal aid. If you could flesh that out a wee bit for me. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm just on the, the four days you'd ask why we had um gone with that. I think we're trying to we're trying to strike a balance between giving the police enough time to be able to make an order and balancing the, the human rights concerns raised by a number of respondents in relation to the alleged perpetrator. Um, so that is why we had gone for the four days. I think in relation to that one, you know, we were, you know, one of the key considerations, is, as you point out, was in relation to kind of the, the police position in relation to that. A number of the respondents that were suggesting that the time period should be longer were citing kind of operational reasons, um, you know, the need to give police sufficient information to, to take that forward. I suppose in, in terms of um, our considerations on that, we also looked at what the position is in relation to some of the notices and orders elsewhere for the current domestic violence protection notices and orders, which we have legislation for, but which weren't implemented. The time frame for that is 48 hours um, in relation to England and Wales. It's 48 hours there, and it's also going to be 48 hours for their new domestic abuse protection notices and orders. As Emma says, it was very much about trying to kind of get that balance. And I suppose we were conscious that if we were to go for seven days in relation to um, the, the notices before an order is in place, that is potentially a significant period of time that an individual is prevented from either contacting someone or having access to your property, and, and, and I suppose probably more in, in terms of access to property mm -hmm. without there, yeah. there being the necessary oversight with, with the court. I think the key thing, though, probably in relation to that is that it's one that we will very much want to, to keep an eye on in terms of does the four days work in practice, you know, and that's, that's something that we'll consider as part of the evaluation process, obviously. Thank you. 
Um, turn to the, the next one in, in terms of the positive requirements time frame. I suppose at, at this stage we haven't kind of fully fleshed out or gone through you know, what the time frame is going to be for positive requirements being introduced in, in due course. I, I suppose the, the key priority or thinking for us in relation to that is really going to be in terms of getting the initial kind of underpinning structure of the notices and orders well bedded in before we look at, at bringing that forward. Um, a further key consideration also is going to be the issue around budgets and resources um, and having that in, in place. So that will be um, also an important consideration in, in terms of um, taking that uh, forward. Um, on the electronic monitoring, Linda, we know you're, you obviously didn't raise a, a query in relation to that, but obviously know no. the, the concerns that there are in, in relation to that. And, and, and as we've, we've noted on that, you know, there, there were significant concerns from respondents in relation to that, and, and there is a considerable amount of further work to be done in relation to that, and, and in terms of how targeted that may be if that were to be introduced in um, due course. Yeah. Emma, will I maybe hand to you for the, the next one? Yes, yeah, is that the rural area? Yeah, one? the rural areas. So um, I think we're just going to do a bit more work with the police and courts to look at um, uh, the statistics and trends and to, to see which one would be most appropriate in a rural area. Um, okay. Yeah, but we can keep you updated on, on those discussions to see which um, which area would you go with? We haven't decided yet on that. I suppose more generally, we're also happy to kind of do periodic updates to the committee if that's helpful in, in terms of how work in this, this area is, is progressing, if, if members would find that um, useful. In terms of the evaluation pilot point, um, agree with you, Lyndon, in terms of the, um, the you know, schemes being piloted out, um, you know, and we will want to ensure that work in relation to that evaluation is undertaken promptly at the end of the pilot and that we can then move into, assuming that that is all um, positive, that we can move into to roll out of that scheme as, um, or, or the protection notices and orders as quickly as possible. Um, after that, we will try and, and keep that, that period to a minimum um, and ensure that kind of the, the next steps follow on quickly um, from that. And then just in terms of the, the final query um, around the legal aid, um, further discussions, I suppose, to be taking place with colleagues in the department in relation to that and how that works. I think at this stage, our sense is that it's likely that the legal aid provisions will reflect those that are currently in place in relation to non-molestation orders, where effectively there is a waiver, um, which our understanding is should typically be automatically applied by legal services agency and um, certainly in relation to non-molestation orders where, where that's requested. Um, we also had further discussions with legal aid colleagues this morning just in terms of kind of getting clarification around the, the non-molestation order side of things more generally because we're aware that there have been concerns in relation to that and, and certainly the indication that we've got from colleagues is that you know in, in some respects almost regardless of the, the level of wealth of an individual um, most people should be eligible for legal aid assistance with that and even for those at the upper end, you know, the, those most wealthy individuals, the cost associated with a normal molestation order when the waiver is applied should be no more than a couple of hundred pounds. But as I say, there, there's further work to be undertaken in, in terms of how that will operate and, and to try and ensure that that's as effective as possible. There'll also be a piece of work around that in terms of just doing awareness raising with the legal fraternity in relation to this more generally, but also in relation to those legal aid provisions once those are, are brought forward. Okay, that's grand. I, th I think I probably th there is some work to be done in relation to that and um, the legal aid and the waiver issue because it's it's something that comes up time and time again, and, and that's why I'm concerned whenever you're saying that it'll be very much the same as it is applied for um, the non molestation orders because the reason the very reason why I was keen to see the likes of the dapples and the dappens is because non-molestation orders at, at the minute. I just see so many victims not um, seeing themselves as being able to access them because it is costing them money. And then they may get a non-molestation order for is put in place and a week later, the par partner or ex-partner who is entitled to legal aid then takes them back to court and gets the non-molestation order removed. Uh, and they aren't, the other... they aren't in a position to fight it. That's that's yeah. the problem. They aren't in a position. They aren't financially able to fight it. 
The other important element I suppose to take into account in relation to the notices and orders is, you know, there should be very much an increased onus in relation to police and also courts yeah. themselves in no, terms of taking these orders forward. So I suppose the position should hopefully be slightly different and potentially a smaller number of victims making applications themselves. But, you know, mm -hmm. as I say, more than happy that we have further discussions with legal aid colleagues in relation to this. I know certainly in relation to the non-molestation order that, you know, we have flagged with them the concerns on, and they're well aware of the concerns that have been raised previously in relation to this. Our understanding mm -hmm. is that they have done a range of awareness raising work in relation to the fact that the waiver is there, that it is available on, on what the consequences of that should be for whatever reason, despite, you know, considerable efforts on, on their part, there, there still doesn't seem to be a, a, a significant take up in, in terms of that waiver being sought and, and then applied in relation to non-molestation orders being taken forward. But, but certainly something that we will bear in mind in, in terms of taking those, those measures through. Yeah, that, that, that does concern me. I suppose that's the other thing I think needs to be closely monitored is how much the the PSNA and courts are, are using it because that's really where I think the value is going to come in in relation to these dappos and dappos is where um, the victim themselves doesn't have to do, doesn't have to bring it forward and, and the PSNA or, or the courts are doing that for them. So I'm not even ex expecting you to respond to that, but I just do want to flag that up. That for me would be a very important um suppose follow up for us certainly as a as a committee but I'm I'm quite certain that organizations and interested parties will be keeping an eye on it too and I would, I would certainly like to think that the department will keep a close eye on that as well. Yeah, no, definitely that is something that will be considered going forward both in terms of the pilot and, and beyond and um, you know to, to keep an eye on on what that those numbers are looking like and, and what the balance is in terms of where the request for orders are, are coming through from. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. That's my points covered. Okay. Thank you, Linda. Um, we'll bring in Sinead Bradley now into the spotlight. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thanks, Sinead. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for the presentation. Um, to be fair, Linda has covered some of the points that I uh, was um, curious to raise about the rural area. That is an important factor because there will be um, things that perhaps unexpected um, consequences to any policy or that that really should give consideration to rural areas and I think given that there is a pilot stage that is the perfect time um, to roll out and, and see exactly what they are. On that basis I also wondered if any consideration was given to areas that perhaps um, are close to a border area so for example where daily life may involve crossing the border um, at different stages and I appreciate um, certainly post Brexit that data sharing and that may be problematic for the PSNI and likewise in the courts so I just wondered if any consideration had been given to that and perhaps um, that the department might be mindful of that when they are considering where a good rural pilot might be because um, I'm not sure you would capture in any period in time a great quantity of data but a pilot in that area might might be worthy of consideration. Um, secondly to that I want to raise the issue of the safeguarding so the, the courts then the consideration that the courts um, should be able to, to discharge or change um, an order and the consultation rightly pointed out that um, there needs to be protection for the person who the order was put in place to protect and that any application to change would have to be scrutinised to ensure that that person, um, if they are the applicant and, and they say that they can be the applicant to discharge or change, that they're doing so willingly. And as we all know, in these circumstances, there can be quite strong elements of coercive control. And I say that there's reference to the potential of using external bodies um, who are mostly voluntary. And for example, victim support and women's aid, who I would have great confidence in. But I also am very concerned that a lot of the work that we're proposing and bringing forward is relying heavily on their resource and I, I'm not sure that we always follow through in resourcing them 
um, to carry out these additional roles and their valuable roles that they would have to play. To play. So we just wondered if consideration will also be given to if they're part of the solution, are they going to be genuinely resourced to carry out um, their role in that? And I, I finally, I'll not go over the legal aid because I am satisfied that, um, that that's still very much an open piece. And I did hear the, the reply you gave to Linda on that. So I'll, I'll leave that one aside for now. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sinead. Okay. Do you want to do the rural or do the open? <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, so um, in relation to the question about the rural and the, the border area, that's something that was raised by one or two respondents. Um, so yes, we will keep that in mind when we're doing for, when we're having further discussions with police and courts. Something we can, can keep in mind and suggest. So yeah. Then in terms of the query around the the safeguarding, um, you know, I think that's a really valid point in terms of any variation or discharge of the order, and certainly in terms of the legislation being taken forward, what we will want to make clear in that is that where there is to be any variation or discharge of that order, you know, consideration needs to be given and taken of the fact, and, and that should only really be followed through where it's considered that there's no longer um, a risk to that particular individual in, in terms of domestic abuse being carried out or a, a possible future risk in, in relation to that. There, there will obviously need to be um, an ability to scrutinise a, a range of information. I think we suggested in the, the consultation response that you know views would also be sought from the likes of the police um, potentially in relation to that scenario, you know, the, the court will need to be very much attuned to the information in relation to that case. I think this is also where we will see the importance of um, training and awareness raising in relation to the new domestic abuse offence and controlling and course of behaviour um, coming through that the, that the courts are, are very aware and take account of the fact. Um, you know, that there can often be abusive behaviours um, being used to try and kind of further control and um, abuse those, those individuals before any changes are made in relation to that. And then I suppose in, in terms of your query around the involvement of the, the voluntary and community sector, there's, a, there's obviously a, a general piece of work to be undertaken in terms of taking forward these measures and the regulations more generally around the funding and resources um, that will be provided to, to underpin these new measures going forward. So certainly that's something that we will take into account as part of that process. Okay. Yeah, appreciate that. Thank you. And just one final point, if I may, Chair. Um, I just wondered if there has been a conversation or much consideration given to an individual who presents perhaps over a period of years um, in different settings and with different people and is repeatedly subject to orders or notices. Is that pattern of behaviour captured now and I am refraining from using the word register or anything, but is there is there a place where this data starts to form a picture so that the court is aware of an individual's um, persistent behaviour because I, I do get that corrective piece or going out to um you know do correctional behaviour type work but if there's repeat and repeat offenders is that captured anywhere? I suppose not I suppose for want of a better phrase, not necessarily in terms of what's considered to be a register. I, I think kind of what will be provided for through the regulations is the notification requirements and I suppose notification requirements in other arenas within the justice sphere, you know, so for example on the, the sex offender side, you have what is commonly referred to as a sex offenders register. There isn't a register as such, rather it's the associated notification requirements. Um, in relation to that, that kind of give rise to that term. So that that aspect of notification requirements will be critical um, to the orders going forward so that those individuals do have to advise police as to their whereabouts, where there's a change in their circumstances, um, etc. I think it will also, a, a, another key element, I, I suppose, in terms of the coming together of new policy areas will be in relation to the domestic abuse offence. And I suppose what we would hope is that you know, once that has been introduced, embedded in, it should be quite clear to the court where there are individuals that are involved that have a history of abusive behaviour and who potentially have been um, found guilty of the the new domestic abuse offence. So I suppose through those two elements, I would envisage that that you will be able to encapsulate some of that information in in terms of victims that are subject to ongoing or repeat abuse and where there are individuals who are committing. 
um, abusive behaviour on, on an ongoing um, uh, basis. So as I say, the notification requirements, I suppose, would commonly in other areas be deemed to be a register, albeit that there isn't a kind of physical register as such, if, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sinead. And Rachel Woods. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much. Um, most of my questions have already been asked, um, but I just want a, a few things for clarification. Just in terms of the decision to go to a pilot, um, why was that taken? Um, just, just wondering, and, and, and the length of time then as well, 12 to 18 months. Um, and the urban and rural uh, noticed in the report then as well um, was been discussed. Um, it says on page 28 that it would be sort of Belfast dairy, but then we've been talking about having one urban and one rural. So is there going to be the two cities, the two urban centres plus a rural area or is, is are those the two areas that have been chosen? Um, and just having the... The, a, a pilot then for maybe 12 to 18 months and then an evaluation period and then rolling out just maybe to, to echo what Linda was saying just about that potentially up to three years then after now that we're looking at if we're commencing the domestic abuse bill uh, provisions at the end towards the end of this year plus then 18 months of evaluation period you're talking maybe two and a half plus years until they're in um, just to get a clarification on that um, and I've got just a few more things for clarity, but just just on that pilot scheme, just why why was that chosen as the avenue to go down? Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of why a pilot, I suppose the the main reasoning behind that was really just given the extent and nature of the changes that are being brought forward. It's it's a fundamental kind of new element in terms of the criminal justice system. Um, but more so, I suppose, in, in relation to kind of the, the family and civil side as well. So it was felt, and I, and I suppose in, in terms of the information that's available um, to the department, it was felt that that's needed in order to kind of get best estimates and, um, you know, a, a sense of what the extent of the notices and orders are going to be before rolling that out on a on a full scale basis. Um, you know, we're obviously keen on, on as we advise Linda in terms of kind of the pilot on, on taking that forward. We would be keen that the time period between that pilot completing and any further rollout of, of that can be kept as, as short as possible. Um, you know, what we will want to be doing is to, to be undertaking, albeit it won't be a formal evaluation as the pilot is being undertaken, but to undertake and, and kind of keep a, a very close eye and, and review that that measure, and the notices and orders more generally as, as they're being brought forward so that we have a, a good sense by the end of that pilot period in terms of how things are working, what may need to be adjusted, what's working well, perhaps not so well, what changes may be needed in, in terms of kind of the, the, the further um, rollout in relation to that. Emma, do you perhaps want to address the urban rural one and then I'll yeah. do the, the time frame? Sorry. Yes, so the, the urban one we had originally been suggesting perhaps Belfast, but a number of um, respondents had suggested Derry, London Derry. So for that urban one, we're now considering both Belfast and Derry, so it'll be one or other for the urban, and then we'll have the rural one as well. So yeah, okay. effectively, it'll, it'll, it will still be two sites. Yeah. It's just, you know, we're looking at one of two possibilities in, in terms of the urban one, or, or certainly consider those as the, the most likely one. Then, Rachel, just in terms of the, the query around the the time frame, um, you know, as I say, there's a, a range of kind of further um, detailed work to be undertaken in relation to the, the policy before we start drafting the regulations. Um, you know, we will be keen, obviously, to try and get this work progressed as, as soon as we can, but there is a lot of detailed work to be undertaken before we can kind of get to the point of, of introducing um, the pilots. As we say, we will be keen to try and kind of <coughs> keep that pilot period as short as we can and to have any um, extension or rollout after that, kind of following as, as soon as possible after that. I suppose we're conscious that in terms of getting a good feel as to what the numbers may be, what the cost may be, all of which will impact and feed into kind of the any longer term introduction of this. To go any shorter than, than 12 months is, is probably really too short a time frame to kind of get a good feel for this, not least just given that it will take a period of time for these new notices and orders to actually bed in and, and be used to you know the extent that we want to see them being used. But but fully appreciate um, 
you know, general concerns on, on committee concerns in, in relation to ensuring that we can move this, this forward as soon as possible. Oh, thank you, Veronica. I appreciate that. It's just so we're all aware that it's this is not something that's going to come out at the end of the year. Yeah. And then people start asking, why can't I get a domestic abuse protection order? So, uh, as you say, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very valid point in terms of, you know, there's a, a lead-in period in terms of that policy preparation, the drafting of the regulations, the pilot, etc. But even to get to the point of having the pilot introduced, as you say, you know, that isn't going to be a, an end of the year or, you know, even kind of next year type of thing. You know, it, it is a, 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 a more medium term introduction. OK, no, thank you. It's just to try and make sure we're, we're all aware. Oh, this is not, not going to be um, August 2021 when you can apply for a DAPO. Um, as much as that would be, that would be great. Um, just another uh, point to part, just the, it says just, I'm um, just in the letters here that we've had in our committee pack, um, the DVPN and DVPOs, it says that the department are going to, um, keep, keep an eye on how they're being implemented in here in Northern Ireland. It's my understanding that they weren't being ruled out here. No, the, the Minister had taken that decision previously and I think I've written to the committee at a, an earlier stage to say, and, and this was in part due to concerns that were expressed by voluntary sector partners as, as well as discussions that we had with the police. Yes, effectively, domestic violence protection notices and orders won't be introduced locally. Um, it was felt because what we had considered at one point was should we introduce the domestic violence protection notices and orders in the interim until such times as the domestic abuse protection notices and orders were in place and, and I think kind of on, on balance in, in terms of the conversations that we'd had with partners, it was felt that it was better to wait and bring forward these new orders rather than kind of move to something in the interim which was different and, and not considered to be as, as effective as, as the new orders. So yes, those won't be brought forward. It, it will essentially be the, the new abuse notices and orders that are brought in. I, okay, I think the, the reference in the letter was um, for us to keep an eye on the DVPNs and O's in England and Wales to see if there's just that's, any learning that's a good we, point, could, we could um, get from that. No, absolutely. I was just a bit confused because I, that I, I would definitely knew that they weren't being introduced, but it said that we're going to keep an eye on them here. It was like, no, <laughs> that, that's that's fine. Um, in terms of costings, and Veronica mentioned about costings, um, even do you have any idea at the moment of how much this, or how much this is going to cost um, criminal justice agencies? And also, is there any consideration of how much uh, you know if a if an individual applied, if they were allowed to say for apply to apply for uh, DAPO, how much it would cost um, for criminal justice agencies and also for an individual? I think in terms of some of the earlier work that had been undertaken, I think an estimate was potentially in the region of maybe 500 to 750 pounds. I, I don't have um, exact figures to hand and, and that would have been based on some of the information that we would have had from England and Wales. In terms of an individual um, taking an application forward, obviously, you know, the, the desire is very much that these are brought forward by the police on a victim's behalf in, in terms of the notices or orders, or that these are taken forward as part of court proceedings in the family and civil side. Um, in terms of an individual requesting one of these, you know, as we say, what we will want to do is to look at that from a, a legal aid context, um, you know, to ensure that individuals aren't disadvantaged or, or put off applying for these, you know, as, as a result of any cost that may be associated with that. Okay, thank you. Um... The other couple of issues um, I had just quickly was on the electronic monitoring. Um, how is electronic monitor or tagging currently legislated for here? Any provision in relation to that would be done in, under public protection legislation. I'm, I must admit it, it's not my area and I'm, I'm not familiar with what the current legislative provision in relation to that is. If it's helpful, we can certainly um, find that out on, on the advisory committee in relation to that. Well, thank you. I'm sorry, it's a bit on the spot there. No, it's just in terms of the, uh, I, I recognise the issues in terms of having, say, electronic tags on somebody who has got no conviction or is, is not, um, you know, it hasn't been charged with anything. Um, and I'm just wondering if it, if under the current, if, if the current public protection legislation then only allows for electronic tagging under those circumstances, and is that something that then 
would would need to be changed if, if that's the route that um, we're going down. But no, certainly um, I appreciate there's a lot more work to be done on, on, on that kind of thing, um, especially. I suppose in- just to, to answer that question in terms of the legislation, um, you know, certainly if a decision is taken following kind of the further work, the human rights impact assessments, et cetera, that electronic monitoring was to be brought forward in relation to these um, orders, further legislative change would be needed in order to provide for that. So it, it would be further secondary legislation that would be being mm-hmm. brought forward to, to deal with that. So yes, legislative mm-hmm. provision would, would be needed for that over and above what we already have in place. Finally, Chair, just um, with regard to one of the concerns that the bar had raised in the um, correspondence pack that we have, um, it, it raised issues about the wide definition, including family members. Um, and I just clarify the proposals that we're talking about here in the DAPOs and the, and the notices and the regulations that you may be bringing forward are consistent with the definition that exists in the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Bill. And that also confirm that these orders and notices would apply to anybody of any age over the age of criminal responsibility. Um, yes, on your first point, that yes, that's correct. So the the definition will um, be the same as the the act, and will include family members as well. Um, on the the age, yes, that will will also be the same um, for anyone over the age of criminal responsibility. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Rachel, and um, thank you, officials. If, if members are content um, with, I know, Veronica, you mentioned around give, providing periodic updates, and I think that would be helpful. So um, if you were able to do that for the committee, um, I'm sure the committee would certainly welcome that. Um, but on, on that note, can I thank you very much and your team for giving us that briefing? Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay, thank you. So, members, we will note the results of the consultation and the uh, current state of play in respect of that and the proposed next steps. And then we will be obviously considering the matter further when proposals for the subordinate legislation are available. Um, and we'll obviously pick the issues up at that stage. Unless there's any other particular point members wanted to raise now, we will be able to follow up on this in due course. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Agenda item five then is the Criminal Justice uh, Committal Reform Bill, the formal clause by clause consideration. Um, Following the informal deliberations of the clauses uh, around this bill that took place uh, on the 22nd of April, the committee agreed that we wouldn't be bringing forward any amendments to the bill and was content with the bill as drafted. So officials have also confirmed that the department um, uh, does not intend to propose any amendments either to the bill. So the committee um, will now undertake the formal clause by clause consideration and I will go through uh, the clauses and the schedules of the bill in order and put the uh, questions formally. So members, this should be straightforward, famous last words, um, given the the positions that we all have on this, but I need to just go through it formally. So clause one, um, the abolition of preliminary investigations. Is the committee content with clause one as drafted? Members agreed? Agreed. No discontented then, so the committee formally is agreed. Clause 2, the abolition of mixed committals, uh, evidence on oath not to be given a preliminary inquiry. So is the committee content with Clause 2 as drafted? Members agreed? Agreed. No discontent. The committee then is agreed. Clause 3 is the consequential amendments and repeals. Is the committee content with Clause 3 as drafted? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, Any discontent? The committee then is formally agreed. Um, Clause 4, the direct committal for trial miscellaneous amendments. Is the committee content with Clause 4 as drafted? Agreed. Agreed. Any discontent? then the committee is formally agreed. Um, I'll put the question on the schedule before Clause 5, as Clause 5 covers commencement of the clauses and the schedule. So uh, on the schedule, amendments and repeals, abolition of preliminary investigations and mixed committals. Is the committee content with the schedule as drafted? Agreed? Agreed. Any discontents? then the committee is formally agreed. Clause 5 is the commencement and transitional provisions. Is the committee content with Clause 5 as drafted? Agreed? Agreed. Any discontents? 
then the committee is formally agreed. Clause 6 is the short title. Is the committee content with Clause 6 as drafted? Agreed. Agreed. And any discontent, then the committee is formally agreed. Uh, on the long title, uh, as this is the end of the clause by clause consideration of the bill, the committee must now consider the long title of the bill. So is the committee content with the long title of the bill? Agreed. 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 Any discontents? Then the committee is agreed. Okay, members, thank you um, for uh, going through that. Uh, that uh, the draft report on the bill is uh, currently being prepared, and that will be circulated for consideration to members before the end of May, and that will then allow us to um, close off this consideration process uh, once we have the draft report. So that will be uh, before the end of May. So thank you, and thank you to the, the committee staff for their work uh, on this. Uh, agenda item six then is the damages return on investment bill. The update on the just the written evidence. Um, the call for written evidence on the damages bill closed on Friday the 30th of April. An additional submission was received yesterday from the Department of Finance. So the total number of submissions received is now 27. Uh, the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries and the CBI for Northern Ireland have asked for a short extension for uh, putting in a submission uh, at the end of this week. So there is a list of the responses received by Tuesday that's been provided in the meeting pack. Copies of the submissions, including the one received from the Department of Finance, have been placed in the electronic uh, bill pack and an email with the link to this pack issued to members this morning. Uh, just so members, if you can agree, then the written submissions uh, redacted where necessary uh, will be placed on the committee bill web page. Everyone has agreed. Agreed. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So proposals for the oral evidence sessions then on the bill that's being prepared um, for members' consideration at our meeting next week. Uh, if there's any that members have already highlighted just in your written submissions that you have ha had a look at, uh, just flag that up with the committee uh, clerk. But there will be a, a paper next week in terms of the oral evidence uh, sessions as to who would be best to come forward for that, and we can consider it at that meeting uh, at that stage as well. Okay, members, so item seven on the agenda. Uh, in March 2020, the committee considered proposals by the department to undertake a public consultation on policy proposals for new organised crime offences in Northern Ireland. The committee agreed that it was content for the consultation to take place and it would consider the proposals further when the results of the consultation were available. The committee also requested further information on how the proposed new offences would link with existing paramilitary related offences and sentencing frameworks. In its response, the Department indicated that while it is envisaged that the new offences may be applied in cases involving organised criminality linked to paramilitary groups, the offences of directing or participating in organised crime and the enhanced sentencing powers they carry would have a wider implication beyond such groups. The Department has now provided the results of the consultation, which indicate that while there is general support for the policy intent to bring forward bespoke organised crime legislation for Northern Ireland and for the proposals themselves, a range of issues have been uh, highlighted, including in respect of the proposed statutory definition of what is serious organised crime. So the Department does intend to consider and undertake take further work on the issues that have been raised over coming months uh, in the context of the recently published Organised Crime Strategy 2124 um, uh, document and will update the committee on the proposed next steps and the development of the legislative provisions in due course. So members, that is there um, by way of noting in terms of the results of the consultation, including the issues that have been raised, and that we will then consider this matter further when the Department has carried out its additional work, uh, and we'll be able to pick the issue up at that stage if members are content with that process. Uh, then we'll note the update. Okay, agreed. Uh, item 8. Uh, at our meeting on the 15th of April, the committee noted the Department of Justice and the Department of Health would shortly be publishing a Year 6 action plan under the Stopping Domestic and Sexual Violence and Abuse Strategy, as well as a progress report against the five-year action plan, and these would be shared with the committee once cleared by the community's education and finance ministers. Uh, the Department has now provided both documents. The Year 6 action plan sets out the programme of work to be delivered by the Department of Justice and other departments and justice organisations during the 21-22 year under the various strands of the seven-year strategy. The, five year, uh, the Year 5 progress report highlights key achievements uh, during 2021 
um, but does not give any information on any actions that may not have been achieved or which may have been carried forward uh, to this year's action plan. So if members are content, um, we will request further information from the Department on the position regarding delivery of all of the actions contained in the Year 5 Action Plan for which uh, DO, the Department of Justice organisations were responsible and if any were not completed, uh, what the reasons for this were and whether they have been carried forward to the Year 6 Action Plan. So if members are content with that, um, that we will request that and that we then note the Year 6 Action uh, Plan. Okay, members are content. We'll also agree to request then an update on delivery of the Year 6 Action Plan from the Department at the end of October um, to provide us with more information at that stage. Okay, members, thank you. Um, item 9 then on the agenda, following correspondence from the Public Accounts Committee advising that it dot, did not intend to hold an inquiry into the matter um, in respect of the uh, Northern Ireland Audit Office report on mental health in the criminal justice system. Uh, the committee agreed to request an update from DOJ on progress to address the findings and recommendations uh, of this report. The Department has now provided the update. It's indicated that two of the report recommendations have been achieved and the third has been partially achieved. It has also uh, provided details of a number of strands of work and interventions that have been progressed by the Department um, and its health and justice partners to achieve the recommendations. So if members are content, we'll note the update that has been provided. Um, uh, Okay, um, I just see a few hands there um, coming up, so uh, members can express uh, any other views that they wish to in respect of this. So let me bring in Rachel. Thank you, Chair. No, um, this was, uh, was good to have this update. I've just have two matters, um, one of clarity really. In the appendix is page 397. It states that the action plan is currently subject to a further update, um, but I'm not too sure, is this the update? that we got, or is there another one coming? Um, just with the dates of the letters, um, and if there is a further update, could you know we be able to receive that? And also then, just for me, in terms of, and I'm more than happy to ask this myself, um, but in terms of page 100, 405, um, looking for a drug recovery unit at McGabry Prison, um, it would certainly um, be uh, eager to find some more information out about what that is. Um, but I, again, Chair, I'm more than happy to, to ask um, that question myself. Okay, well, we'll check in terms of the, is this the update or if there's another update to come, we can check that and, and um, come back to you on that one, Rachel. Um, Linda Dillon, your hand's up as well. Thank you, Chair. Um, just in terms of the, the point that Rachel has just raised around the the um the drug program in, in McGabry, I, I certainly would be interested to to know more about that as well. So I mean I'm content that the committee would ask that question. The other question I just think that we should be asking as a committee, obviously there has been good progress made. The budgetary constraints and some of the things that were outlined in the budget and potential um, risk to programmes and particularly in skills programmes etc um, within the prisons how that's going to impact any further progression not not only I mean we're, we're not only talking about the mental health of, of the, the prisoners in, in the system we're talking about the mental health of the staff because staff whose mental health is not looked after obviously that does not have a, a positive impact on those who they are looking after I mean as as people would point out, you put on your own oxygen mask before you can help others. I just think that the, the, the budget that has been outlined to us and some of the potential cuts, I have concerns the impact they would have on any further progression around um, mental health in the criminal justice system. Okay. Just to flag that up. Well, listen, I'm happy for the committee to, to raise those points for the department. It, it does mention around the dashboard indicators um, for supporting um, the monitoring of the outcomes for offenders with mental health issues so we can find out where that is at um, because it's it's connected to that so if members are content we will raise that with the department of justice okay content um, correspond Thank you, correspondence there's a response from uh, the director of public prosecutions to the committee's request for a timeline and date for completion of the review of the pps decision 
not to prosecute anyone in relation to the funeral of Bobby Story and for him to attend a committee meeting to discuss the matter <coughs> and wider prosecutorial issues, including the length of time it takes the PPS to reach decisions on important issues of public interest. So, members, the director has indicated um, that while it is difficult to be precise about a time scale, it is not envisaged that the review process will have concluded and been publicly communicated before the end of May. Uh, the director has uh, also highlighted that the, if the decision upon review remains the same, um, it is anticipated that judicial review proceedings may be initiated, and if that is the case, it could be some months before a substantive hearing takes place and a judgment delivered. So the director um, he has advised um, that he is happy to appear before the committee to assist with any matters of concern or interest about the wider PPS functions or processes uh, that do not relate to specific prosecution decisions, including the time required uh, to take prosecution uh, decisions. Um, so, uh, members, obviously, he's indicated a willingness to come uh, to the committee and we'll seek to schedule that in in due course. Obviously, he's highlighted the time frame for the review in respect of the uh, Bobby Story funeral uh, issue, um, uh, not until the end of May. Um, so obviously any um, appearance before the committee uh, would need to be in that context. And I know members wanted to, to discuss wider prosecutorial issues. Um, I, I would anticipate that in light of uh, some of the, the judgments even in the past 24 hours, they would be areas that members um, from maybe differing perspectives may wish to, to engage with the PPS as well. So we, we will seek to um, schedule that in due course. It will likely be in and around the June time um, for that. Um, I don't have any uh, other... Chair? Yes, sorry, Linda. Sorry. I'd, uh, I've been raising and lowering my hand there that much. I, I wasn't sure whether you'd spotted it. Just obviously to again declare an interest in relation to the the PPS issue and, and around um, Bobby's funeral. I am one of the people who, who are under investigation on that. Given that, if, if the PPS the, are coming in to the committee, we probably need to look at can can we schedule if there's going to be any conversation around that particular issue for the beginning of the conversation so that I can absent myself. I don't think it would be appropriate for me to be yeah. um, involved in that conversation. But obviously, I do have other issues that if the PPS are coming in, I would want to be part of the conversation. So if there if there's some way that you can make that work for the committee, yeah. No, I don't think that will be a difficult day, so we, we will be able to, to work our way around that. So that's fine. Um, chairman's business is the next item then. Um, just to note, I've been invited along with a number of other Assembly Committee Chairs to meet formally, informally with Simon Hoare MP, who is Chair of the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee, to discuss scrutiny of the NI protocol. Two meetings have taken place so far. Uh, unfortunately, uh, on both occasions, uh, I haven't been able to attend because of other assembly duties that arose at short notice. Um, just to advise on that, the Committee for Economy has provided a copy of a letter from its chairperson, uh, Simon Hoare, advising of its preference that scrutiny continues on the basis of written correspondence rather than by meetings to better enable all members to be kept informed and discussion uh, remains focused on scrutiny of the protocol from a committee perspective rather than the exchange of political uh, viewpoints. Uh, I suppose members, just my comment on that, whilst I haven't been able to attend both of those meetings, having read some of the notes of it, it does seem to me that this uh, body uh, is more around a wider political conversation that seems to be taken. Um, I, I take the view that if I would have been attending that meeting, it was there to reflect on Justice Committee uh, aspects um, that were related to it, as opposed to necessarily my wider political views on that. Um, but it would appear that conversations are, are straying into a much wider political conversation about it. So uh, I, I wouldn't be in disagreement with what the Committee for the Economy is doing on it, but um, I think that's something that we just need to tease out in terms of what is going to be the, the purpose of this um, body that's, that, that has been set up um, as to how, if you're a chair of a committee, does that give you licence to give a par party political perspective whenever you're taking part in these meetings? Because from my reading, reading of it, that seems to be the way in which it's being conducted. Um, and I, I just think that that's something that we need to figure out. What is the parameters for chairs of committees when they're taking part in these meetings? How much latitude are they given to, to give a party political perspective as opposed to a committee perspective? Uh, and I just think we need to try and um, 
establish what the, the, the kind of ground rules are for engagement whenever it comes to the, the next uh, meeting of this. Uh, and that's something that um, I was going to be raising at a chairman's liaison um, group meeting whenever the next one takes place so that the chairs of committees can have a discussion around that uh, and then from that meeting hopefully feedback to committees. And I think for all parties' benefits it will just be helpful to get clarity on that uh, and also for the committee. So if members are content, that I'm just raising that in a general sense. That's what I intend to do at the next CLG meeting to have a discussion around that and then come back to the committee uh, so that everybody knows um, you know, what, what, what basis chairs are going to be taking part in that. Chair, can I just say I think that's a very fair and measured approach to it and I support it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sinead. Uh, any other business members? No. If there's no other business, then our next meeting is due on Thursday, the 13th of May at 2 p.m., and that will be in the Senate Chamber and also via the Starley facility. Okay, members, the meeting's adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern. This is the Northern.